This is the Pixel 8, the regular version. And if you're familiar with the channel at all, then you'll probably be aware of the fact that I am a true fan of Pixel phones. Like the Pixel 7 Pro was the phone I used whenever I wasn't reviewing other phones this year. And the regular Pixel 6 was the phone I used the year beforehand. And so needless to say, I was super excited to start using Google's newest offerings, the Pixel 8 and 8 Pro. And for those wondering, yes, I do have the 8 Pro in house and yes, I will be reviewing it as well. However, last year, I think I did a disservice to the regular Pixel 7 by reviewing the 7 Pro first. So this year I wanted to try and be as unbiased as possible by flipping the script and reviewing the regular Pixel 8 first. And so one month after its release, I'm finally ready to share some thoughts. You ready? Let's dive in. All right, starting with the design. And I've got to say, Google has made some fantastic choices in terms of the changes to this phone's design this year. To start, we have these much more rounded corners on both the top and the bottom, doing away with that boxier design that we saw in the previous year's models. And that change alongside the slightly smaller 6.2 inch size makes this a very comfortable compact phone compared to much of the competition. In fact, there have been one or two instances where from the front, I've actually thought that it was my Galaxy S23, which has very similar rounded corners to the Pixel 8 and that more compact form factor as well. And just to clarify, that's definitely not a bad thing because I love the design of the Galaxy S23 as well. And whilst the side rails and camera unit on the back still have that beautiful matte finish, the back glass itself unfortunately still has the same glossy finish that the previous year's models had as well. And I sorely wish this phone had gotten the matte upgrade that the 8 Pro got, but alas, it was not to be this year. The only other thing worth mentioning in terms of design are the bezels on the front, which have seen an even bigger reduction down from last year's Pixel 7, which is very much appreciated. And whilst I would have loved Google to have trimmed down the size of the chin a bit further to make the bezels consistently sized all the way around, it is definitely small enough for me to honestly not notice it at all. And while we've got the display in front of us, let's talk about it. And for mine, this is probably the best upgrade that the regular Pixel 8 received this year. Firstly, it now has a beautifully fluid 120Hz refresh rate matching its more premium pro counterparts. And this upgrade alone elevates the regular Pixel lineup from its previous mid-range status to a serious contender in the flagship category. Now, keep in mind, it can only alternate between 60 and 120 hertz, not all the way from one to 120 hertz, like the 8 Pro can. And by default, for some odd reason, the display is actually set to 60 hertz straight out of the box. So if you do pick up this phone, make sure to come into the settings and turn this smooth display setting on to enjoy maximum fluidity. But my oh my, this new 120 hertz display alongside all of those amazing Pixel UI animations that we've all come to know and love, Man, it makes the experience of using this phone outrageously buttery smooth. I love it. Then add to that that we now have a much brighter display rated at a max of 2000 nits in terms of its peak brightness, and also that it somehow achieves those brighter levels more efficiently than last year's models. And I gotta say, this is one of the best displays I've used on a phone of this size this year. Then we have the haptics. And when I turned this phone on for the first time, my initial thought was, Dang, these haptics are strong. In fact, funnily enough, they were a little too strong for my liking. You see, I tend to be someone who thinks that the best haptics aren't just overtly strong, but that they also should have a nice layer of subtlety to them. Whereas out of the box, as I said, the haptics on the Pixel 8 were a little too on the nose for me. Thank goodness Google has this vibrate and haptics settings menu though, under which I actually dialed this touch feedback all the way down to what is essentially a one out of three setting, which for the most part gave the haptics that subtlety I was after. That being said, even after changing that setting, I still found that the haptics when typing were just that little bit too strong. And so again, coming into the keyboard settings and into this preferences section, I was able to dial this vibrate strength on key press setting down to 25%, which I found was just about the perfect number to emulate that subtle yet firm nudge that I'm after when typing. And look, I've got to say, it's settings like these that make me enjoy Android so much. Real quick, I do wanna say, I don't know why Google have persevered with using subpar in display fingerprint sensors on their phones, because for me, this is an area that feels like it may have even taken a step back in comparison to last year's phones. 
I honestly never really noticed the fingerprint sensor on last year's Pixel 7, but this year I've had noticeably more failed scan attempts and I'm definitely noticing the lack of speed this time around compared to other phones on the market. Now, don't get me wrong, I still absolutely adore Google's Face Unlock implementation and the fact that it's been upgraded to Class 3 this year, meaning it actually works for security and banking based apps or contactless payments and the like, which is seriously amazing. But after three years now of using lackluster in-display sensors, it seems high time for Google to address this once and for all with next year's Pixel 9 lineup. So Google, if you're watching, switch to ultrasonic, make it larger, and then we'll be talking business. Okay, from there, let's chat about the battery. And let me just flag to anyone thinking about buying this phone, the first few days of use are not gonna yield great performance in terms of battery life. But do not panic because after about a week or two, Google's adaptive battery kicks right into gear and you'll get a much more stable experience. And for me, after about that amount of time, I'd say that whilst the battery on this phone doesn't compete with high-end flagships, which I guess is thanks in part due to the display not being able to crank right down to one hertz, and also just due to it being a smaller size device, therefore not being able to fit in as big a battery. Despite all that, I'd rate the battery life on this phone a solid B, maybe B plus. Like, yes, I'm ending most days with around 20% remaining, which isn't as good as other phones I've used this year, but I am also getting to the end of each day, no problem. And honestly, based on past experience, I actually expect the phone to get better with battery over an even longer period of use, given how Google uses software to optimize things according to your usage. So suffice it to say, whilst this phone doesn't offer the best battery life on the market, it's also nothing to sneeze at at the same time. All right, before we press on, just wanted to take a moment to thank today's video sponsor, Superhuman, which is by far the fastest email experience ever made, now also available on Android. So with Superhuman, you'll be able to power through emails twice as fast, whilst also being more responsive to the emails that matter most. It's designed for lightning fast navigation using keyboard shortcuts, but then on top of that, it comes packed with a huge range of productivity boosting features. There's the split inbox system, which allows you to zero in on critical emails. You've also got the ability to snooze and set reminders for emails, and you can even take advantage of their incredible snippets tool, which lets you insert automated phrases, paragraphs, or even entire emails if you like, with just a few keystrokes. They've also just recently released their superhuman AI tool, which will help you to write faster than ever before in your own voice and tone. Plus, there's also a huge amount of additional tools and features on top of those to go with. So to maximize your productivity when it comes to emails, try superhuman free for a month using the first link down in the description below. All right. Then we have the cameras. And whilst on the surface, this seems to be an area that hasn't seen many changes compared to last year's Pixel 7, Google has actually made a few pretty key changes in my opinion that I am super grateful for. For one, the main camera, whilst very similar to last year's Pixel 7, has gotten a slightly wider f1.7 aperture, which means in theory, it should be able to let in more light, therefore meaning the camera doesn't have to lower the shutter speed as much, which in turn should hopefully result in images and videos being slightly less prone to motion blur. I mean, this is a small upgrade, but I'll take more light wherever I can. But then the change that I actually appreciate even more so is what they've done with the ultra wide lens. In fact, the Pixel 8 has actually gotten the exact same impressive 126 degree ultra wide lens from last year's Pixel 7 Pro. And this means that that pretty disappointing 0.7X ultra wide that we had on the regular Pixel 7 last year is now not only a much wider 0.5X lens, but it also now supports autofocus, therefore unlocking macro functionality, which again, the regular Pixel 7 did not have. And in fact, that was one of my biggest complaints about the regular Pixel 7 was that it felt like a much more subpar camera configuration compared to what we had on the 7 Pro. Well, this time around, aside from the lack of a telephoto lens, the camera configuration feels much more complete on the regular Pixel 8. And don't forget, we still have that 2X cropped mode that we can take advantage of, which make no mistake, does produce far better images than just digitally scaling up a 1X shot after the fact, even if it is impossible for you to tell 
after YouTube's compression. And so in reality, we now have a fantastic ultra wide lens with macro support, a fantastic main lens, and a kind of almost 2X telephoto lens. And that combination of lenses three or so years ago would have been an industry leading camera configuration. Now, does part of me wish that Google had added a proper 3X telephoto lens here? Of course. And in fact, that could have made this phone even easier to recommend compared to the competition. And I do seriously hope that they add one on next year's Pixel 9. But even without a dedicated telephoto lens, I still think the camera configuration on this phone is amazing. As for what images and videos look like, I mean, I've always loved how Google processes its images and that is no different with the Pixel 8. And as someone with three kids, whenever I use a Pixel phone, it always just gives me so much confidence in terms of taking pictures of people. Like, I'm just gonna say it, no phone on the market is better at taking photos of people in terms of what the end results look like than Pixel phones. Photos of things that are not people also look incredible. And I even think that videos captured on this phone are looking really, really great this year, especially when they're captured in decent lighting conditions. Now, in lower light conditions, this is where videos tend to drop off a bit on the Pixel 8 with grain presenting itself a bit earlier than it often does on other phones and with stabilization becoming a bit too jerky for my liking. So yes, there are still improvements to be made, more so on the video side of things, but by and large, I'm actually still very satisfied with where we're at right now in terms of what I'm able to capture with this phone. Okay, finally, we have the software and performance of this phone. And for the most part, I would argue that this is still the very best software experience you can get on any Android phone, thanks to how well thought out the entire UI is with all of those beautiful animations and just very thoughtful additions, like how the wallpaper transitions here when selecting between these wallpapers, or the way that the lock screen clock animates in and out of the always on display. Plus there's a bunch of other examples like this sprinkled throughout the rest of the software as well. And for what it's worth, Android 14 has been virtually bug free for me ever since I started using this phone. And that does kind of make sense given how iterative this update was compared to previous software updates. But again, if you're someone who values a bug free ultra smooth experience, then this phone is up there with the best. The issue I think is the Tensor G3 chip. You see, when Google launched the Pixel 6 series with the first Tensor chip a couple of years ago, I think we were all willing to forgive Google for any inefficiency and performance issues with that chipset given it was their first foray into the chipset market. And look, whilst competing chipsets were definitely better and more efficient, it wasn't as outrageously obvious as it is right now. In fact, over the past two years, since that first Tensor chipset was released, we've had some really serious gains in pretty much all other competing chipsets on the market, to the point where this Tensor G3 chipset now firmly feels as though it's much closer to a mid-range chip as opposed to a flagship chipset. And for the most part, in terms of navigating your way around the OS, opening and closing apps, even playing most games or doing pretty much any everyday task, the phone is totally fine. Where it becomes really noticeable is in a few key areas. Firstly, editing photos using any of Google's really impressive AI-based features. Man, it takes an absolute age on this phone. And you might think, well, that's because they're AI features. But then when you try and do anything similar on, let's say the latest iPhone 15 Pro with Apple's A17 Pro chip inside, and you see how much faster it can do the same things, hopefully you're starting to see what I'm talking about. Even taking images itself on an iPhone, I can capture as many pictures as I like without any delay regardless of the mode. Whereas on the Pixel 8, not only is there like half a second delay between snapping each shot in normal mode, but if I switch to portrait mode, for example, I can take about three or four shots before the app just completely blocks me from taking any further photos for like five seconds plus. And I know that's when it's doing its processing, but again, the iPhone is able to do its processing in the background whilst I continue taking shots. Even this wallpaper changing animation I praised earlier, I was actually using a bit of editing trickery to make that appear faster. Otherwise it would have taken too long to showcase when in actual fact, it takes like three seconds for the wallpaper to actually change. Now look, for me personally, whilst I obviously don't love these issues, 
They're also definitely not deal breakers for me either, but I bring them up to shed light on the fact that it's now become clear to me that Google is actually quite a ways behind in terms of overall performance and efficiency with their Tensor lineup of chips. And I don't know, if next year they were finally able to match their competitors in terms of those areas, then I'd say, okay, let's persevere with Tensor chipsets. But if we're still like three, four, or even five more years away from Google finally catching up, then just like Samsung did with ditching their Exynos chip in favor of the top end chip from Qualcomm, I think Google surely has to follow suit and do the same. Now, whilst we're still talking about software, I will also add, I am seriously baffled that Google is still the only software manufacturer, yes, including Apple themselves, that puts unremovable widgets on its home screen, which I've been complaining about for years now. And unfortunately, whilst last year I was able to use Nova Launcher to get around this, thanks to improved fluidity, I think something has changed with the Android 14 update, making the experience not quite as nice. As a result, I've actually reverted back to using the stock Pixel Launcher, which don't get me wrong, is incredibly fluid, but man, the fact that I can't remove everything from this home screen and then set up any sort of configuration that I like, like I did using the iPhone 15 Pro or the Nothing Phone 2 or even the Xiaomi 13, man, it's an absolute travesty. And whilst I usually love Android for its incredible customization flexibility, the fact that the Pixel Launcher is less customizable than an iPhone for goodness sake, that is seriously mind boggling. With all of that being said, and despite some complaints here and there, I actually still love this phone. It's got that beautiful form factor with an incredibly bright and fluid display. It's got a fantastic camera configuration. And whilst I wish that Google kept the launch price the same as last year's regular Pixel 7, or at the very least that they ditched the 128 gigabyte configuration, I still have a very soft spot for this phone. And if you've been interested in picking up a Pixel phone for yourself, but that higher price tag of the Pro lineup has been a little too hard to stomach, then I'm positive that you will seriously love this phone as well. Now, as mentioned, there are still some areas that need improving, such as the fingerprint sensor, some issues with performance and efficiency, the lack of a customizable home screen, and I'd of course love to see a 3X telephoto lens on this model in the future. But for me, despite all that, this phone is still one of, if not the best all around experiences that you can get on an Android phone at this price point right now.